Hi, I'm Brett Jones, and I'm a professor of educational psychology at Virginia Tech. This is a Constructing Your Knowledge video for Chapter 10, Assessment Strategies, in the Ormrod and Jones book titled Essentials of Educational Psychology. In this video, I'm going to focus on a few assessment concepts that can be confusing to individuals new to assessment. I'm going to start by asking you to answer the following six questions as true or false. Please pause the video to read the questions and write down your answers as true or false for each question. Now let's see how you did. Number one is, classroom assessment must always involve paper and pencil. For instance, it must always be a test of some kind. This is false because many forms of assessment require little or no use of paper and pencil. Number two is, Assessment is an activity that is totally separate from the process of classroom learning. This is also false. Classroom assessment practices significantly influence what and how students learn. Question three. A little bit of test anxiety can enhance performance. That's true. Recall the distinction between facilitating and debilitating anxiety made in chapter six. This shows that a little bit of test anxiety can actually be a good thing. Number four. Innovative forms of assessment, such as performance tests and portfolios, are always preferable to traditional paper and pencil assessment. This is false. Depending on the objectives being assessed, paper and pencil assessments are often a perfectly legitimate way of assessing what students have learned. Number five, multiple choice questions can be used to assess rote memorization of trivial details, as well as many higher level skills. This is true. As long as you take the time to carefully construct the ones that measure higher level skills. And finally, number six is standardized tests are highly accurate measures of students' abilities and achievements. This is false because standardized tests are imperfect measures at best, and no single test should ever be used to make decisions that affect students over the long run. But standardized tests can be good measures of some abilities and achievements. Okay, now I'm going to quiz you on a few more concepts to make sure that you understand some important points. But first, remember the RSVP acronym used in the Ormrod and Jones book. A good assessment instrument is reliable, is standardized for most students, has validity for its purpose, and is practical. You can remember this with the acronym RSVP. Now let me give you a quiz about these concepts. In this scenario, a teacher gave the same test to the same person one week apart, and the student didn't learn anything new related to the concepts tested, and didn't do any more studying. On the first test, the student got a B minus, but the second time, he got a B plus. What's the problem with this assessment? Pause the video if you need to think of your answer. Now you could say that the student remembered some of the questions from the first time he took the test. But let's say that he didn't know which questions he got right or wrong, and didn't think about the test between, and didn't remember anything else. If that's the case, this is a problem of reliability. Remember the definition of reliability? Reliability is the extent to which an assessment instrument or procedure yields consistent information about the knowledge, skills, or characteristics being assessed. In this case, the test is not giving consistent results. If it was, the student would have gotten the same grade both times he took the test. Think about a bathroom scale. If you get on and off a scale, the number should be the same if you haven't eaten or used the bathroom in between. The same thing is true for this testing situation. So we could say that this test was not very reliable. Now because the student got in the B range both times, you could say that it's fairly reliable. It's not like the student got an A one time and an F the next but it's not perfectly reliable. Is this test reliable enough? Well, it depends on what the teacher is going to do with the test score. Every measurement has error. It's just a matter of determining whether the error in measurement is acceptable in that situation. When I give a multiple choice test in my classes, I realize that on any one test, students might get a little higher or lower than they deserve because my tests aren't perfectly reliable. But over the course of the semester, these things should even out if the error is random. I'm sure you usually remember the questions that you got wrong and think that only if I'd gotten that one other one right, I would have gotten a higher score. But you also have to remember that on a multiple choice test, you probably guessed or were unsure of a few answers that you got correct. 
so ideally these would balance out to provide a fairly reliable score of your knowledge. I'm not saying that always happens, but when I design a test, that's the goal I'm working towards, knowing full well that it's not a perfectly exact measure of a student's knowledge. This is where you have to balance reliability and practicality. I could get a much better assessment of students' knowledge if I interviewed them for an hour or two, but that's just not practical in a course where I have 50 students. Now I want to ask you a question. Which of these archers is reliable with her five shots? The answer is archers one and two. Do you see why? Even though archer two did not even hit the target, she was consistent. And the definition of reliability involves consistency. So for that reason, even archer two is reliable. Archer 3 is not reliable because her shots are not in a consistent pattern. What are the problems with this assessment of dancing on Dancing with the Stars? You might not think there's a problem, but the problem is that all of the judges don't agree on the same rating of the dancing. Why not? They should. Pause the video while you think about which concept this relates to. Well, one of the problems is reliability. There is not very good inter-rater reliability. That is, across judges, the ratings aren't consistent. My prior examples were related to the same person scoring the assessment. But there is also reliability across judges, which is called inter-rater reliability. Now again, is the reliability good enough? Well, maybe. So it's probably okay, and probably very practical. But it's obviously not perfectly reliable. Did you think of another issue? there's likely not an exact standardization of criteria used by the judges. Remember that standardization is the extent to which an assessment involves similar content and format and is administered and scored in the same way for everyone. One example is that student responses are scored using the same criteria. Maybe they are using the same criteria, but maybe one judge thinks that style and dress are more important and another judge thinks that the technical issues are more important. So they have the same criteria, but they weight them differently. In this case, a lack of standardization could lead to lower reliability across judges. Okay, let me ask you something else. In class, first grade students learn basic addition facts from one to five. On the test, the teacher asked, find the area of a square with sides that are three inches long. What's the problem with this test? Think about the RSVP concepts and pause the video while you consider this. I'll give you a hint. It's a validity problem. Remember what validity is? Validity is the extent to which an assessment actually measures what it is intended to measure and allows appropriate inferences about the characteristic or ability in question. But be more specific. What type of validity is the problem with the test question? Maybe it will help to represent this problem visually for you visual learners. I'm just kidding. Remember from prior chapters that everyone is a visual learner. Remember that the book discusses three types of validity on page 366. Content validity is the extent to which an assessment includes a representative sample of tasks within the domain being assessed. Let's say that for something a teacher taught, all the possible content is shown here in this box with X's. So if the teacher had taught basic addition facts, these X's would represent the different addition facts. If a high school teacher was teaching a unit on the Civil War, these X's would represent different facts and knowledge related to the Civil War. In some cases, the box would be small because the assessment may only cover a small amount of content, while in other cases, the box may be very big because there is a lot of possible content covered on the assessment. Now let's look at the assessment of this content. If an assessment of this content only included questions related to the content shown here with X's, then the assessment would have low content validity. Remember that an assessment does not either have or not have validity. Rather, it's on a continuum. So although there is some content validity for this assessment, it's on the low end of the continuum because there are a lot of X's that are missing and the content assessed is limited to a few specific topics if we assume that the X's are in order of the content learned. So this assessment is heavy on the topics learned at the beginning of the unit and near the end with not much coverage of the topics in between. After a test like this, you might hear students say, the test only covered two of the 10 concepts in the chapter. If the student had studied these two concepts, she might be happy about this. But if not, 
the student might feel that the test was unfair and didn't adequately assess her knowledge. Now look at this assessment. This assessment has higher content validity because it covers a representative sample of the content. It's rare for a teacher to be able to assess all of the content that was supposed to be learned. So teachers must select some of the possible content and use it to make inferences about the complete knowledge that a student may have about a topic. Because the X's are spaced out in this assessment, it shows that there are questions from a variety of the content, which should lead to a more accurate assessment of a student's knowledge than the assessment on the prior slide I showed you. One way to ensure that you have content validity is to create a table of specifications. A table of specifications for addition might look something like this, where the rows include different topics, such as single digits, multiples of 10 and 100, two-digit numbers, and three-digit numbers. The columns show the different behaviors that students are supposed to be able to do, such as computation using the number line and rapid recall of the sum. This table provides specifications for a 30-item paper pencil test on addition. It assigns different weights to different topic behavior combinations. The numbers indicate the number of items out of 30 that are devoted to that topic behavior combination. So out of the 30 items, it shows that 6 require the rapid recall of a sum for single digits. This table of specifications allows the teacher to see how much of the topics are covered compared to the others. The blank cells indicate that there are no questions on this assessment about that topic behavior combination. Let's move on to another quiz for you. In this example, first grade students learn basic addition facts with digits from 1 to 5. Then, students are assessed in part with the following question. Katrina has two electronic devices in her possession. She permits Camille to borrow one of them. Please determine the number of electronic devices that Katrina now has in her possession. What is the problem with this assessment? Pause the video if you need to think about it. The problem here relates to construct validity. Construct validity is the extent to which a test score measures some construct that is an individual characteristic such as math reasoning, reading comprehension, creativity, or intelligence. In this example, the question has low construct validity because the vocabulary level is very high for a first grade student. If most students cannot read and comprehend this question, then they cannot answer the question correctly, even if they know that 2 minus 1 equals 1. As a result, this question would likely measure students' knowledge and reading comprehension skills. Remember that we can only talk about the validity of an assessment for an intended use in a particular context. So although this assessment might have a low construct validity for use with first grade students, it might have a high construct validity for high school students because they can understand the vocabulary. The last type of validity discussed in the book is predictive validity, which is the extent to which a test score predicts the performance on a future activity or test. So an example of this would be the extent to which the SAT predicts how well 10th grade students will do in college. If the SAT predicted students' GPA in college pretty well, then we would say that the SAT had a high predictive validity. If it did not, then we would say it had a low predictive validity in this context. Another example would be the extent to which this test item predicts how well first grade students will do in college. It seems unlikely that one question given to first grade students such as this could predict their success in college. So it likely has low predictive validity. On the other hand, it might have a high predictive validity for how well students will do on their spelling test next week. So again, we cannot say that an assessment has a high or low predictive validity without giving information about the context and what it predicts. An assessment could have a high predictive validity for one thing and a low predictive validity for something else. If we look back at the definition of validity, we see that the part underlined here refers to content and construct validity because they both get at the extent to which an assessment actually measures what it is intended to measure. The second part of the definition refers to predictive validity because it allows appropriate inferences about the characteristic or ability in question. So to summarize, if we look at this question about Katrina, for a first grade student, this item has high content validity because it measures a basic addition fact. It has low construct validity because it also measures vocabulary and reading comprehension, which likely prevents their score from representing their true mathematical ability. And it has low predictive validity for success in college, although it might predict something else. So you might be wondering, 
Why can't all tests produce reliable and valid scores? Well, it's usually an issue of time and money, which relates to practicality, which is the extent to which an assessment instrument or procedure is inexpensive and easy to use and takes only a small amount of time to administer and score. If we had the money, we could hire experts in the content area to write questions. And if we had the time, we could try them out with students, look at the results, and test them out some more. But doing this takes a lot of time and money. Big testing companies, such as the one that created the SAT, can do this, and they're able to create assessments that measure certain constructs better than you and I could do with limited time and money. But assessments also have to be practical to administer to students. Teachers are limited by the amount of classroom time they have and by the attention span of their students. It's probably difficult to give an hour-long test to first grade students because they'll have trouble concentrating for that long. For these types of reasons, it's a balancing act between creating practical tests that are reliable, standardized, and produce valid scores. Okay, I hope that these explanations have helped you to further construct your knowledge of some of the concepts in Chapter 10 of the Ormrod and Jones book. Thanks for watching.